chapter nine capacitors so chapter nine in your book all right so we're going to go over you know basic types of capacitors and we're going to talk about how capacitors uh, work and do some different calculations for uh, calculating capacitance and reactance all right we're going to cover what those are when we get there uh, just so you know there's no such thing as a flux capacitor uh, but we already know what flux is right magnetic field capacitors stores a charge so you know um, an inductor actually stores a magnetic field so it's kind of weird they call it a flux capacitor it sounds cool but uh, an inductor actually is what uh, stores the field so that's interesting but uh, let's go ahead and get rolling here uh, chapter 9 in your book all right so what's a capacitor it's a device composed of two parallel conductive plates separated by an insulating material all right that insulating material we have is called a dielectric material all right so um, we're going to kind of break down and go through a couple different capacitors here and see, you know, kind of what's on the inside. Because, you know, when we pass these around and look at these in class, you can't, can't really see the inside of what these guys look like. Uh, but, you know, I start thinking about fruit roll-ups. That's kind of really what's going on, the little plastic thing versus the fruit stuff. Uh, good, you know, kind of one of the better analogies or like a Swiss roll. I know we're getting hungry thinking about food, but uh, in general, that's kind of what a capacitor looks like on the inside as far as, you know, the materials. But what's the point of a capacitor? A capacitor stores a charge. All right, so remember, batteries only have reactions. They don't store the charge. But a capacitor stores a charge, all right, for a specific amount of time, all right, until you dissipate all of that charge. So we're going to learn that it takes a certain amount of time to charge a capacitor, and a certain amount of time to discharge a capacitor. But I mean, essentially, you know, we have two conducting plates, some form of metal type uh, material that we're gonna go through, and we have some sort of dielectric that sits in between those, uh, that separates the plates. So we really actually hold that charge between the two plates until it's called upon. Uh, so, you know, when's it called upon? Well, if you're having a heart attack and they gotta defib you, Okay, that's a that's a uh, capacitor that sits in there. All right, a taser is a capacitor. The touch screen on your telephone uses all capacitors, and things like that. So, uh, capacitors, uh, you know, they're they're all over the place. In your microwave, you can find uh, a capacitor because your microwave's got to step up to like a thousand volts. All right, and you can't really do that at home, uh, you know, with your 120. So, there's a capacitor inside your microwave that helps do this. So how do they really work? All right, so this is what a capacitor looks like when it's uncharged. We got, you know, the leads, we have the, the two plates, and we have the dielectric material in between. All right, so what happens is we, we hook that a capacitor, you know, up to a battery or some sort of power source. So if you notice, there's a whole bunch um, on your motherboard, in your computer, or in your TV, or those sort of things. So we use them to charge and discharge in your car stereo. If you have, you know, a lot of amplifiers in there that are really booming a sound, well, if you don't have a capacitor, what happens is when you boom that low bass sound, it drains your battery. So if you're driving at night, your car lights will dim, all right, and then they'll come back on kind of based on sound. Well, what you do is you use a capacitor to smooth that out. So instead of drawing from the battery, the amplifier can draw from the capacitor, all right, to smoothen it out for those low bass signals so the battery doesn't drain. So if you have a large enough capacitor, like a 10 farad capacitor or something like that, it takes a lot longer for that capacitor uh, to drain so that your battery doesn't get hit every time a big bass note or something hits uh, when you're doing that sort of thing, all right? So remember, electrons flow negative to positive. So as we are charging up a capacitor, this is essentially what happens, all right? We're filling up one side with negative, we're filling up the other with positive, or electrons and protons, essentially, you know, as we get through there. If you want to think of it that way in terms of the atoms of whatever that material is, all right, when we talked about, you know, valence electrons and things like that uh, <clears throat> back in the first couple chapters, that's kind of really what we're doing, all right? So when we have it fully charged and we remove the source, all right, Every, the capacitor is sitting this way. So that's why, you know, if you unplug a TV and you go to work on it, you want to discharge the capacitors because they can store the charge for a very long time and you can really hurt yourself uh, if you do that. Because uh, <clears throat> one basic way to fix your TV 
if it starts to go all berserk on you, is just look for a couple of the bad capacitors and replace them, and then your TV should work just fine. That's the simplest uh, repair that you can do on your TV. If it ends up not working, just open up the back, look for some capacitors that have uh, domed up and bubbled over, resolder them, put some new ones in. Um, TV should work just like new. All right, so after you know we remove the source and we want to discharge it, so like you have your taser or your defib. All right, so it it can act as a temporary battery. It's not, and we're not talking like hours of energy uh, or that sort of thing uh, with when we have a capacitor. All right, it's a short discharge, uh, you know, but it does it does matter on the the resistor that it's with, and it does matter on the size of the capacitor. So like when I was talking about the car example, all right, that's a really large capacitor, so the time constant on that's going to be a lot longer. Okay, but it can act as a temporary battery uh, when we do that discharge. So how would we just in general calculate capacitance? All right, capacitance is charge over voltage, charge over voltage. So Q in coulombs divided by V in volts. All right, so capacitance is the ratio of charge to voltage. So let's do, uh, you know, the basic units that we have here. For capacitance, we are going to use what we call a farad. Okay, most of the time, most of the capacitors that we deal with in class or that you see on your motherboard, you know, those are small capacitor sizes, microfarads, um, nanofarads, uh, but still pack a very powerful punch. All right, very, very powerful punch. Okay, but a farad is the unit of charge. Or not a unit of charge, I'm sorry, the unit of capacitance. Okay, so if we want to calculate charge given a capacitor and a voltage, all right, Q equals CV. All we did was take that top equation, C equals Q or V, and solve it for Q instead of C. All right, so let's do an example here. We have if a 22 microfarad capacitor is connected to a 10 volt source, the charge is, okay, so what you have to remember when you do this problem is that's 22 microfarads. You've got to remember that micro is times 10 to the minus 6. So you're going to take 22 times 10 to the minus 6 times 10 for our volts, okay? So when you do that in your calculator, you should get 220 micro coulombs, okay? That's essentially what you're doing, all right, this is just a basic analogy, is that you store a bunch of rubber bands and in, you know into a bottle all right so you keep shoving them in keep shoving them in keep pushing them in more and more and more and more and more and more, and more until it's full right and the lid's just ready to kind of explode and you would take the lid off and they would kind of spring just a small an analogy there all right but the capacitor stores the energy in a form of an electric field that field is between the two opposing charges so we we saw a few slides ago um, as uh, you know, all the uh, the pluses were on one side, all the negatives were the other side. So in that dielectric is where we really capture and, and hold and store that charge. We store it in there until we call upon it to flow. All right, so energy, you gotta be very careful here with energy. Um, I don't like that it's W because W to me, right? Watts law, power, that sort of thing. Um, energy is one half CV squared. One half times capacitance times voltage squared. This W is not watt, it's not power, okay? This is energy, okay? Think about when we talked about work and that sort of thing uh, earlier on in the semester. So energy, the units are joules, all right? Capacitance in farad, and obviously V for voltage. All right, so the voltage rating, uh, when you look at a motor, or you know some sort of electronic device there's a voltage rating on it uh, it's rated to handle a certain amount of voltage all right so you don't want to go over that so what the rated voltage is that's the amount of voltage that can be withstood across the plates so if you look at a capacitor on there it will physically say and I'll, sh I'll remind you when we have a couple pictures of some capacitors come up it'll say you know that it's a you know 0.45 microfarad capacitor and it'll say something like 90 volts or 120 volts or that sort of thing. All right, then we have what we call a breakdown or working voltage. That's voltage at which the capacitor actually gets damaged, okay? So that's the working voltage, all right? 
then we have the dielectric strength of the material. All right, different capacitors have different materials on the inside. So what that dielectric strength is, is it, it serves right as an insulator because we're trying not to let the two plates connect, but we want to store everything in the field between the two plates. Okay, so the dielectric strength, when we start talking about the dielectric material that's in capacitors, all right, it's really just an insulator that helps us you know, because we can't, we don't want the two plates to actually physically connect, all right, because then we wouldn't be able to store a charge. It would just be like a short circuit and current would flow through it. So different materials have different strengths, and that's how we can create different capacitor sizes. And I don't mean physical side. I mean, I mean capacitance size, like microfarads or nanofarads or that sort of thing. All right, but you can take a look uh, in your book in Table 9-2. Um, page 392, I don't know if it's quite 392 in the global version, I didn't look at that, or the world version. Um, but in the normal version, alright, the, uh, the book we used, it's on page 392. You can look at the different dielectric strengths of different materials. Uh, they're inside of capacitors. Alright, there's also a temperature coefficient. Uh, that's the amount of, you know, in direction of change the capacitor can change with temperature. Alright, so as the ambient temperature, or think about you know, when you have a motherboard inside your, um, the, the case, right? That case gets warm, so there's different temperatures versus when you first fire up your computer versus it's been running for, you know, like five or six hours straight, okay? And then there is some leakage, all right? Not, di not every dielectric is 100%, um, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking here for? Insulating, all right? They're not 100% insulators between the two plates. So, you know, eventually if you unplug your TV and let it sit for like three years, those capacitors are obviously going to drain. But if you unplug it and try and work on it in five minutes, it's not, they're not going to be drained in that amount of time. So, you know, there, there's some leakage that occurs uh, over time. So you can put a resistor over there that helps limit that leakage. So if we put a resistor in parallel with a capacitor, Right, you're gonna kind of force it to kind of go in a certain direction so that you can help limit the flow of current uh, so that you slow down the leakage. All right, so let's get down, you know, kind of the nitty gritty. Uh, the plate area, that's, uh, the capacitance for it is directly proportional to the plate area. So we have two different plates here. And this is, you know, somewhat semi-deceiving because essentially we roll the capacitor up and we have different plates and different levels. So this is like a very small chunk of a capacitor. It's not the whole, like, capacitor. There's not just two plates uh, and so on and so forth. But the more plate area that we have across from each other, the greater the capacitance will be, okay? So the plate area affects capacitance and also plate separation affects affects capacitance okay so it's inversely proportional to the distance so the further the plates are from each other so that means the more dielectric material that's between the two plates the less capacitance we'll have so the closer the plates are together right the less dielectric material we have the more capacitance we have and that's how we can change capacitance values by changing the amount of dielectric material that's between the two plates uh, as we place them together, okay? So the dielectric constant, okay, or its relative permeability, it's what that really is, is we're figuring out how well that material can establish an electric field or like a magnetic field, okay? Capacitance is directly proportionate to the dielectric constant. So we're really just talking about a material's ability to establish an electric field, okay? So we compare it to what we call absolute permeability of a vacuum, so we have epsilon naught here, and ER is our dielectric constant, or epsilon R, okay? Equals epsilon over epsilon naught. Epsilon naught, okay, that's a general constant that we're gonna be using, is 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12th. So for us to calculate capacitance, we're gonna take that C, all right, is capacitance. We're gonna take the area, okay, the plate area, times the dielectric constant, epsilon R, times epsilon naught, okay, 
which is the 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 farads per meter, divided by the distance in meters, okay? Now, when we start talking about capacitors, there's, very, there's, there's multiple types of capacitors, all right? So if we look inside like a motherboard on a computer, you're gonna see most of the types I'm gonna go through here. So why would we use something like mica? This is a mica type capacitor, okay? So if we notice, there's layer upon layer. So think lasagna, all right? We have foil, we have mica, we have foil, we have mica, we have foil, we have mica, so on and so forth. That's all combined into that little Advil looking type thing, okay? Now, the point and why we use mica, right, is we put that where the electronics are going to be exposed to more heat. So you might see more of those in your motherboard or things like that where there's constant heat being given off um, by the circuit board, okay? So the mica capacitors are very small, but they can work with higher voltage, okay? And their dielectric constant is roughly about a 5. And the tables in the book, I don't expect you to memorize the table. Um, or just, I don't expect you to memorize dielectric constants for different capacitors or things like that. I just really want to make sure that you understand, you know, what's inside a capacitor and kind of how it works. Okay. So let's look at a ceramic disc capacitor now. So obviously the dielectric material is ceramic. They have a relatively high capacitance. Okay. So their dielectric is 1200. And this is what they look like. So they're the ones literally that look like the little Advils. All right. And you can kind of see how everything's kind of put together. We have the two wires coming in. All right. With the electrodes that are soldered in to the ceramic dielectric. Okay. And then we give it that dipped uh, phenolytic coating. All right. That's what makes it look like an Advil sort of thing. But that's just to protect it. Okay. From any static discharge or any other things like that. So that's what our, our ceramic disc is made of. Okay, a very common one here is plastic film. And this is when I was talking about, you know, like a Swiss roll or a fruit roll up or that sort of thing. All right, where well, we just really have foil and a plastic film, foil, plastic film, over and over and over and over. All right, so these ones are not polarized. So the past two I talked about, the mica one, Okay, not, that one's not polarized. The ceramic disc one, not polarized. Plastic film one is not polar, polarized. Remember when I'm talking about polarized, I'm not, I'm talking about a positive and a negative end, right? The electrons have to flow a specific way through that capacitor. None of these are that way. So when we breadboarded, right, we had an LED that had a long leg and a short leg. These particular capacitors aren't like that. So that's what I mean when I'm saying non-polarized. Uh, they have a high capacitance due to a much larger plate area. All right, so these are rolled up. So the plate area becomes rather large. All right, so we can store more because we have more dielectric material uh, that's in between, or less. It's a very thin, like, plastic film. But since we can roll that up and make a bigger capacitor, all right, we're able to store more charge. Okay, because there's a whole bunch of different plates kind of on top of each other. All right, so the electrolytic capacitors are the ones that are polarized, okay? It does matter which direction that you put those into the circuit, okay? There is a negative side, there is a positive side. These have very high capacitance. Most common ones, what we have, they're not as precise as the other ones, and they do tend to have more leakage current, but they're the only ones that are uh, polarized. And these are the ones that we see like in our kits and things like that where we've breadboarded. Uh, we have an aluminum electrolytic. It's still rolled, all right? We still have aluminum, we still have plastic, and it's rolled. Now, the difference is the symbol so that you can notice when you see this type of capacitor symbol. So normally a capacitor symbol is two straight bars, right? When you see one with one straight bar and a curved bar, that one's electrolytic, which means it's polarized, which means it does matter which direction you put that in the circuit. Okay, so that's the symbol for any uh, electrolytic capacitor. Now the tantalum electrolytic, those are also polarized. Now, you don't see those quite as much tantalum, just the material versus, you know, aluminum's in the other one. Just a different type of metal material uh, for capacitance to be stored. Okay, but these ones are electrolytic as well. And, you know, some of these are so small, it's tough to cut open, 
and give you a good look. But here's a good couple cutaways uh, at what each kind of capacitor looks like on the inside. All right, another power, you know, where else do we use them? Like in, in power, we use a power factor correction because, you know, not all energy uh, when we produce it or electricity when we produce it is clean energy. All right, so even if we're using turbines at the Hoover Dam, all right, as those turbines, you know, water comes in, pushes the turbines and moves, you know, there's still some inconsistencies in that sinusoidal wave. So we use a capacitor, all right, to help clean up the signal for our AC cert. All right, we also, you know, use them to filter out and we use capacitors to actually rectify and make, a, you know, DC. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later on towards the end. All right, and then we have, you know, a capacitor like you see on the right that would go in like a defib or to go into a microwave, all right? So it depends on the amount of energy uh, that we want. So, you know, they're not just the little guys that we see in, you know, your motherboards or those sort of things. But they can be very big. So uh, just, you know, different, you know, reasons we use capacitors. We use capacitors also to uh, control signals. So when you're tuning your radio to a specific station, all right, we use, you know, resistors, capacitors, and that sort of things to obtain certain frequencies. Okay, so variable capacitors, they have small capacitor values. You can adjust them manually. They're usually called trimmers, patterns, or tuning capacitors. All right, so these are what I was talking about when we were referring to radios or things like that. Because, right, your radio would really want to hone us in. Um, every, you know, you go up and down your radio, you're at 101.1, 101.3, 101.5, uh, that sort of thing. So we want to be very accurate uh, when we're doing a tuning capacitor. So um, they have, you know, smaller capacitance values, but we can adjust them manually uh, by turning them. Okay, a reactor diode. Uh, that's a semiconductor that it acts kind of like a capacitor in a sense, but we adjust it with an electrical signal instead. That's really uh, what it is, okay? And the difference between a normal diode and a reactor diode, or kind of a Zener diode, is it allows uh, sometimes current to flow the opposite direction. That's really what it is. But we can dial it in. This is what a lot of the different ones look like. All right, we can adjust them with a the screwdriver or those sort of things, all right? Uh, I don't have one of these for us to take a look at and pass around, but there is a capacitor meter so that you can, you know, check your capacitance and, you know, just kind of like we do using an ohm meter, checking a resistor and that sort of thing, or checking a transistor. Same kind of concept, all right? So uh, most of the time, most of the capacitors actually have the size stamped on them. All right, so remember I talked about like uh, voltage rating being on there too. So like that blue one would have a voltage rating too. But the blue one says what? 47 microfarads, okay? So most of them have, you know, 0 0.001, 0 0.01. When you see those and they don't have anything else on them, we always, always assume them to be in microfarads, okay? So always assume that they're in microfarads, okay? The electrolytic capacitors, um, also, microfarads. Okay. So, if we just talk about capacitor labeling, if we take a capacitor that's labeled as a 103 or 104, uh, you know, remember how we had to read resistors, we got to read capacitors. Okay, so what's that mean? That's 10 times 10 to the third, and then we're going to say that it's picofarad. Okay, or the 104 is read 10 times 10 to the fourth, which is 100,000 picofarad. So that's if we see a labeling as like a 103 or a 104. All right, it means 10 times 10 to the, the last digit tells us how many zeros there's really going to be. Okay, so if we see them marked as 330 or 6800, we're going to default them to picofarads, not microfarads like the other ones. So if we look at these two capacitors here, right, the first one, uh, you know, 222, or the second one is uh, 2200. Both of these are 2200 picofarads, okay? All right, so we have to solve for capacitors in series. What I want to do is break this down in, in how we handle them. And this is where this, you know, chapter gets a little confusing. Um, if you remember when we solved series and parallel circuits back in chapter four and in chapter five, 
All right, we had to solve them a certain way. So when we do capacitance, it's always opposite of how we did resistors. When we calculate total capacitance, when we calculate total reactance for a capacitor, though, it will be just like resistance. Okay, so I want you to understand this is where we flip-flop how we do series and parallel. So if you remember how we did series and parallel resistors, we're going to flop the mathematic piece for capacitance for capacitors, for capacitance only. There's two parts to a capacitor that we're going to talk about. There's its capacitance and there's its reactance. Its reactance is its equivalent like resistive power versus um, its capacitance is its charge that it stores. Okay, so I just want you guys to think about that. I'm gonna do a separate, you know, side lecture that shows how we solve, uh, you know, capacitor and series and a capacitor and uh, parallel. But essentially, all right, we don't change the rules of KVL and KCL here, okay? We will still have a voltage drop across a capacitor and the sum of the voltage drops do have to equal the voltage source. We will have a constant current still in a series circuit, okay? It just matters how we're going to calculate the capacitor. So the ammeter still goes in series and the voltmeter still goes in parallel with whatever we're reading, okay? That part doesn't change versus circuits. All right, now here's what does change. When we find total capacitance in a series circuit, we treat it like we did with resistors that were in parallel. Okay, so we flip flop capacitance with resistors. So essentially, when we connect resistors, capacitors in series, we are going to do the inverse function to find the total capacitance. All right, so just think, finding total capacitance, you're gonna do C1 inverse plus C2 inverse plus C3 inverse plus however many we have, and then the total R inverse. This is for capacitance only, okay? For any number of capacitors in series. Here's the old school way. I don't want you to remember that way. All right, just do the original way that I had on here using the inverse button on your calculators. All right, there is a shortcut. I hate showing the shortcut because the shortcut only applies when we have two capacitors in series, not when we have like three or five, okay? So this is only when there's two in series. So try to just stick with the first method that I kind of gave you, okay? So let's take a look at an example here. We have if a 0.001 microfarad capacitor is connected in series with an 800 picofarad capacitor, the total capacitance is going to be, well, what we need to try to do, if you guys remember from like chapter one, when we talked about um, going from micro to pico, how far are those apart? Well, remember there's six units apart because it goes micro, nano, picofarad, right? So 10 to the sixth, 10 to the ninth, 10 to the 12th. Okay, so there are six decimal places apart. So what you might want to do is actually put them all into the same units. So we can take that, and I just did on the screen, I'll go back and forth, 0 0.001 microfarads, all right? There's six apart. I move the decimal six places to the right, and I get 1,000 picofarads, okay? Do not mess this one up. This is not 1,000 plus 800. If it was resistors, yes, or reactants, yes. For capacitance, no. This is not 1,800 picofarads, okay? We have to do 1,000 inverse plus 800 inverse, all inverse, all right? So our total capacitance will be 444 picofarads, okay? So as long as you put them both in picofarads beforehand, you can do it the way I did and do 1,000 inverse plus 800 inverse all inverse okay so make sure that you're getting that in your calculator all right so if we talk about voltage in series uh, it, it just depends on the capacitance value okay the smallest value capacitor will have the largest voltage across it okay largest voltage drop will come across the smallest capacitor 
All right, so the largest capacitor will have the smallest voltage across it. So kind of opposite, okay? We can use a voltage divider with capacitors, but it's flipped. It's flipped. All right, so remember for resistors, when we did a voltage divider, we did the specific resistor over the total resistance times the voltage source. When we use a voltage divider for capacitors, it's flipped. It's the total capacitance divided by the specific capacitor times the voltage source. Okay, so it's just flipped uh, when we do a capacitor in series to find the voltage drop across the capacitor. All right, now we're going to talk about capacitors in parallel. You treat capacitors in parallel like resistors that are in series. All right, that's the best way I can tell you. So when we find parallel capacitance, we are literally going to add up all the capacitors. Okay, and all the rules still apply. The voltage drop across each capacitor in parallel will still be the same, and we will still have branch currents, just like we do with resistor circuits. Okay, so when we add up capacitors in parallel we literally just take capacitor 1 plus capacitor 2 plus capacitor 3 however many we have okay so if we go back to the similar example from before and we have capacitor 1 which is 0 0.001 microfarad in parallel with capacitor 2 which is 800 picofarad we already know that that 0 0.001 microfarad becomes 10,000 picofarads right or I'm not 10,000, I'm sorry, 1,000 picofarads, all right, because we only moved the decimal six places. All right, now we just take the 1,000 plus 800. This is the case where it is 1,800 picofarads, okay? So when capacitors are in parallel, we can add up the total capacitance. Just make sure that you put them both in the same SI prefix. So you got to take that one from micro to pico. So please remember capacitance when we do the calculations for series or parallel are opposite of how we find total resistance in resistors that are in series or parallel so that reverts back to chapter four and chapter five with you know series and parallel resistors or circuits all right so just make sure and i'll try to make sure we have another example or two uh, in a separate lecture that so shows how to solve uh you know a circuit like this so like I said, though, uh, a capacitor, okay, when we take readings, and these are test questions here, a capacitor appears as an open when we have a constant voltage, and a capacitor appears as a short to an instantaneous change in voltage. What does that mean? Well, that has to do with AC and DC. All right, we use capacitors as filters. So when that capacitor fully charges, okay, and we're using DC, it appears as an open, which means nothing will flow across it. If it's using AC, it's going to appear as a short. So essentially, we're blocking DC and allowing AC to pass so we can filter and do those sort of things, okay? So that's really how I want you to think about that. All right, so earlier when I was talking about your car and using a capacitor in there so that your battery didn't, you know, lose all the power and your lights dim when you get that big bass, you know, going on uh, from your woofer and amp and all that sort of thing. Well, what really impacts the charge of the capacitor and the discharge of the capacitor is called the time constant, RC. What RC stands for is resistor and capacitor. It's a resistor and capacitor combo. That's really all it is. It's the time constant. So you do this calculation for your capacitor to charge and discharge. Okay? And we call that tau. It's not little t, it's tau. So tau means the time constant. And to calculate tau, you take the resistance times the capacitance. The resistance times the capacitance gives you the time constant tau in seconds. Now, note this. Every capacitor takes five time constants to charge or discharge. 
Five time constant, five tau's, not five seconds, five tau's, five time constants. You might, you have to calculate that time constant. That time constant might be 50 microseconds, okay? That would mean that that capacitor would, um, would jar. So if it was 50 microseconds for one tau, that capacitor would charge in 50 times five, all right, or 250 microseconds. That's how long it would take it to charge or discharge, okay? So there's kind of an example of what that works on. All right, so when a capacitor is charged through a series circuit, all right, and we have a DC source, all right, so right now we have a DC source, that's our VS, we have a switch on here that's open, right, so nothing's happening, and then we have a resistor and a capacitor in series here. So we're going to do some basic calculations of what our final voltage is and our initial current as we do this, okay? So if the switch is open, right, we got nothing, then we close the switch, and what happens? We start to charge the capacitor. So you can look at the voltage across the capacitor. That's really what we're looking at in the, in the top portion of this graph. All right, that's the voltage across the capacitor. We start at zero. The capacitor has some sort of exponential growth to it. And then eventually the capacitor will be full. The capacitor can only charge up to whatever the supplied voltage source is. Okay, so if it's a 12 volt source, the capacitor is only gonna be able to go up to 12 volts across it, all right? It'll, it'll still have its charge of whatever it is, you know, you know, 10 microfarads or whatnot. All right, but what happens to the current, all right, when we're charging? So initially the current, that's the bottom chart, is gonna ramp up, right? Or it's gonna start really high. And then as the capacitor charges, the current dissipates. All right, so we're gonna charge, the voltage is gonna kinda grow exponentially, and the current is gonna decay exponentially. All right, so when we start talking about those sort of things. So here's how we have to calculate the instantaneous voltage for capacitor. We have VF, which is V final, or voltage final, plus parentheses VI, which is voltage initial, minus voltage final, close parentheses, times E to the minus T over tau. T is in time, tau is the time constant. So it's E to the minus T over tau. So anytime we get one of these, you always gotta make sure you calculate the time constant. The current equation is the exact same as the voltage equation, only you use current instead of voltage. All right, so you have initial current and final current as we talk about this, okay? So what I want you to think about, what's the initial voltage on that capacitor before we throw the switch? It's zero. So VI is zero in this equation. And V final is 12, whatever our supply, if our supply voltage is 12. All right, so you would substitute those values in and calculate. All right, so you could really simplify it down to this. Our instantaneous, okay, is V final plus one times E to the minus T over tau or RC. So I've replaced tau with RC, so you get used to those. So that's the equation, the bottom one for if we're charging a capacitor starting at zero. Okay, that's for charging a capacitor. That's the equation you want in your notes and that's what you're gonna use. Because I'll give you, I'll, we'll tell you what the final voltage is. I'll give you a resistor and I'll give you a capacitor value. And you'll be able to tell me, uh, okay, what the voltage is. All right, this is for discharging a capacitor. All right, so say we've charged a capacitor fully, all right, and we're gonna dissipate it now. So now the gates of the switch is open, all right, the capacitor is fully charged, and when we close the, the switch, okay, the capacitor is going to discharge in this case, all right? So the equation for discharging is on the screen here. V equals VI, which is the initial voltage, times E to the minus T over tau, or E to the minus T over RC. I always get used to saying T over tau, but know that tau is RC. Okay, whatever the resistor uh, capacitor combo is. So we're gonna start the chart on top, right? Uh, we're gonna start with our initial voltage is high because the capacitor is charged, okay? So when we do this and we throw the switch, our initial voltage is high and then it's gonna exponentially decay. Same with our current. Our current's gonna have a rush inlet, inlet current, 
all right, and then it's going to decay uh, as the capacitor value or charge decreases. Okay, so here's the universal formula. Okay, for for finding it, we've already, I already went through this, right? V equals V F plus V I minus V F e to the minus T over tau. We've already done that. So we, remember the final equation is what I showed you at the bottom of the other slide. Okay, but the greater the initial voltage when the capacitor is charging or less than the initial voltage when it is just charging. That's what the final capacitor voltage is going to be. Okay, it's got to be greater than the initial voltage when the capacitor is charging. The initial voltage when we're charging is generally zero. So it's got to end up, you know, the final voltage has to be greater than zero. And then when we're discharging, all right, the, if the capacitor starts at 12, it's got to end up at zero, right? You have to deplete the capacitor. All right, this chart I will give you on the test, all right, and it will be on your homework assignment, or I would still make sure that it's in your notes, okay? These are the two curves for capacitors charging and discharging, all right? So the, the red or the pink or whatever color you want to call that, that's charging. Notice before I said that it takes five time constants for a capacitor to charge, okay? So looking at time constants on the x-axis if we take a look after one time constant a capacitor is 63 percent charged after two time constants a capacitor is 86 percent charged after three time constants it's 95 percent charged after four time constants it's 98 percent charged and after five time constants it's about 100 percent right 99 now, if you want to know how well it is when it discharges, that's the blue curve. So we start at 100%, and then after one time constant, it's down to 37% charge left. After two time constants, 14% charge left. All right. So notice that if you look at each one of these, 63 plus 37 is 100, 86 plus 14 is 100, 95 plus 5 is 100, 98 plus 2 is 100, 99 plus 1 is 100. So we have 100% there. We're just going the other way. Uh, when we're discharging versus charging, okay? This is very important, okay? A capacitor is going to charge in five time constants. Mm -hmm. Please remember the time constant is not five seconds. It's R times C, whatever that resistor times capacitor value is here, okay? So that's what tau is. All right, so we'll do a couple examples here. All right, so first example, how long will it take to charge the capacitor shown in the circuit below to 16 volts? Use the charging curve shown. Okay, a couple different things here. We're gonna charge it to 16 volts. Okay, what's the maximum charge this capacitor can get? 20 volts, because there's a 20 volt battery, DC battery on there. So when we flip the switch, we're only gonna let it get to 16 volts, okay? So we're going to talk about how long it takes to get there. You have to calculate tau. Tau is R times C. So you're going to take 10,000, right, because we have a 10 kilo ohm resistor, times 0 0.001 microfarads, or 10, 0 0.001 times 10 to the minus 6, times 10,000, and you're going to calculate what tau is. Okay? So tau will be your time constant. All right, but first of all, Okay, we got to find out, you know, how much are we actually charging that battery to? So we got we're going to get it to 16 volts out of 20, or charging the capacitor to 16 out of 20. Okay, so that's 80% of the final value, right? 16 divided by 20 is 0.8 times 100 is 80%. So we're going to get to 80% of the final value. So on the chart, we have to find where 80% is, and remember that we are charging so we're going to use the red or the pink curve not the blue curve here okay we're charging so we're going to use the red or the pink curve so 80 percent of the final value that we have to estimate on the curve where 80 percent lines up okay so when we do that it's approximately at that point right there right 80 percent lines up with you know a little bit more than one and a half time constants so let's approximate it to be 1.6 time constants. Okay, can everybody see where those points line up? 
We're, we got the 80% because we did 16 divided by 20. Okay, times 100. That's the 80%. And then we're going to look at the chart. Where the chart, that's the final value right there, 80%. And we look at how many time constants. We're going to approximate that it takes 1.6 time constants, all right, to get to 16 volts. So we have to find tau. So I'm taking the, the 10,000 times the 0 0.001 microfarad. That gives me approximately 10 microseconds. Okay, that's what one tau is. It's 10 microseconds. Two tau would be 20 microseconds. Three tau, okay, would be 30 microseconds. Okay, so for this capacitor to completely discharge, five time constants would be 50 microseconds. All right, so you're going to take that 10 microseconds and multiply it by 1.6, and we're going to approximately get 16 microseconds. That's how long it takes you to charge this capacitor from zero volts up to 16 volts. Okay. Now think about, you know, how long would it take us to get to 17.2 volts? You would have to do 17.2 divided by 20, okay, and get what that percentage is. All right. Then that's approximately 86% when you do that. Okay, that's going to be two time constants. All right, and we, if we already know the time constant is 10 microseconds, and it takes two time constants, okay, 10 times 2 is 20. So if we wanted the battery to just to, to I'm sorry, charge up to set or the capacitor, if we want the capacitor to charge to 17.2 volts, it will take 20 microseconds to do so. All right. All right, so let's just talk about a couple different things here. When the voltage source is held at a constant amplitude and the frequency is increased, the amplitude of the current increases, okay, which decreases the resistance to charging, okay? And vice versa. Decrease the amplitude of the current decreases, which indicates an increase in resistance to charging, okay? So those are inversely proportional of one another, okay? Now, this is where I said capacitors have a capacitance and a resistance. We call a capacitor's resistance a reactance. Its unit is in ohms just like resistors. Okay, so every capacitor has a total capacitance and it has a total internal resistance, which we call a reactance. The reactance you treat exactly like series and parallel resistance. That doesn't change. That follows exactly what we did in chapters four and five. So what you have to remember is total capacitance is what does the opposite. We did those calculations earlier, right? Capacitors that are in series act like resistors in parallel and capacitors in parallel act like um, resistors in series. That's for the capacitance value. The reactance value, like I just said, I'm going to just repeat this multiple times. The reactance value is the resistance of the capacitor. So when we do reactance, capacitors in series, their reactants just act like resistors in series. Capacitive reactants in parallel act just like resistors in parallel when you do the calculations. So the resistance is in ohms. Now you have to be able to calculate the capacitive reactance for every capacitor in the circuit. Each one's going to have something different. Okay, they're inversely proportional to frequency, inversely proportional to capacitance. So there's a small calculation you got to know. Everything that we call a capacitive reactance we denote as X sub C. X sub C. So the, the reactance for a capacitor is 1 over 2 pi FC. 2 pi times the frequency times the capacitance. All right. So the frequency will always be in hertz and the capacitance will always be in farad. So let's take a look at this example here. We have the capacitive reactance of a 0.047 microfarad capacitor when the frequency of 15 kilohertz is applied is. We're really just finding the resistance value of this capacitor. All right, given the frequency, given the capacitance. Literally, we just have to substitute into that equation. So our reactants are one divided by two pi times 
1500, right, because that's what 15 kilohertz is, times 0 0.047 times 10 to the minus 6, because it's micro, and micro is 10 to the minus 6. So make sure that you have your calculator out, and you plug this in your calculator, and you get the same exact value I did. You get about 226 ohms, okay? So remember, capacitive reactants is the resistance of the capacitor. And we denote them by X sub C. All right, so when capacitors are in series, we literally add up all of their reactants. All right, so let's say that we have 3.033 microfarad capacitors in series with a 2.5 kilohertz AC source. What's the total reactance? Okay, so first we find the reactance of each individual capacitor. So it's 1 over 2 pi FC. So it's 1 divided by 2, uh, 2 pi times 2.5 kilohertz, which is 2500, times 0 0.033 times 10 to the minus 6. That's the microfarad piece. Make sure when you do this, you put the whole denominator in parentheses, kind of like we did on the last slide. All right, make sure that you do this in your calculator at home uh, so that you get the same exact value that I do here. You're going to get 1930 or 1.93 kilo ohms. So now there's three of these in series, so you can multiply that by three or add 1.93 plus 1.93 plus 1.93 and approximately get 5.79 kilo ohms, okay? So when they're in parallel, remember that's the old school way. I don't want you to use the old school way. Use the inverse method that I told you. So if we have the same three capacitors in parallel instead of in series, you're gonna still find the reactants, okay? We did that before, it's 1.93 kilo ohms, okay? And that's doing it the old school way, but you should be able to go 1.93 inverse plus 1.93 inverse plus 1.93 inverse, all inverse, okay? Just like we have right here. Okay, so you can do it this way that I have at the bottom as well. Okay, I prefer you do it the bottom way so that you don't get lost in the algebra. All right? So the capacitive reactance of a capacitor is the same as a resistor, so Ohm's law is in effect. I equals V over R was Ohm's law, right? Now it's I equals V over X sub C. Same exact thing. Same values, same calculations, okay? So we're going to calculate a couple of circuits here, all right? So let's say we want to find the reactance here of this circuit, okay? It's 1 over 2 pi of C. The F is 2 kilohertz, we know we have 2 pi, and our capacitance is 0 0.01 microfarads. Literally, we're just going to substitute into the equation. All right, I want you guys to check and make sure that you get that value of 7957.7 .7 ohms when you do that, okay? Now, you can still get the current, right? The current is still VRMS divided by resistance, so I equals V over R, or V over X, right? So we're going to take 2 divided by 79.57, so the current in this circuit, you should have gotten point, uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0.00025, which is 0 0.25 milliamps. All right, now, just reviewing how to use a voltage divider for two capacitors in series, okay? Remember I showed you the voltage divider earlier that is opposite what resistors are, okay? Now, it depends on if we're doing the capacitive or the reactance. If you're choosing to use the reactance to do the voltage divider, it's exactly like what you did in chapter four with series circuits. If you're choosing to use the capacitor value to do the calculation of a voltage divider, this is where you've got to flip it, okay? All right, so let's work through this. We got, that's an AC source, that's one volt, 33 kilohertz, and we have a 1,000 picofarad capacitor and a 0 0.01 microfarad capacitor. So if we want to use a voltage divider using the reactants, it would be that specific capacitor reactants over the total capacitive reactants. I would tend to do it this way with the reactants uh, so that you just kind of remember what we did in Chapter 4. So we have to find the actual reactance value for each capacitor, 1 over 2 pi Fc for each capacitor, okay? And then we can use the voltage divider. So what are we showing here? The first voltage divider equation is if we are using the reactance, 
the second voltage divider equation that has C total over CX times VS, that's using the capacitor value. Okay, that's really the difference between the two when we're solving the circuit. All right, so let's solve it. So the first thing we need to do is find the, uh, the reactance for resistor for capacitor one. All right, and then we're gonna find the reactance for capacitor two. So that's just using the one over two pi of C for each one of those, all right? So the first resistor we got 4.82 kilo ohms, the second one we got 482 ohms. Now we can just use our voltage divider like we did in chapter two. We find the total resistance, all right? And then we take the specific reactance of the capacitor where the voltage out is or V out is. So that's the reactance of capacitor two divided by the total capacitance times the voltage source or the total reactance of the capacitor i'm sorry i'm just phrasing that all right so we get 4.82 or 482 divided by 5.3 kilo ohms times one volt so you should get approximately 91 millivolts so i want you to make sure that you pause the video you're able to work through all of that and see where everything comes from remember the x sub c is the reactance so we find the reactance of each capacitor then we find the total reactance, it's a series circuit, and we add them because it's the reactants, not the capacitance. We add them up and get the total reactants. Then we take the specific reactance of C2 divided by the total reactants times the voltage source. So that's where we did all that, okay? All right, so if we want to do it, right, what's the output voltage? You want you guys, you know, Give this one a shot. It's really just the same thing uh, as we go through uh, and do it. But it's more for you to give it a shot on your own and recap it, okay? So we can also use the capacitor values, like I said. So this was before, all right? C1 times C2 plus C1, I'm sorry, C1 times C2 divided by C1 plus C2. All right, remember that's the shortcut for two capacitors in series. You get 909 picofarads. And then using the voltage divider, it's total capacitance divided by the specific capacitor times the voltage source. Uh, so you can kind of see where the numbers come from. But if you do it either way, you're going to get 91 millivolts uh, for your solution. Okay. So how does a capacitor impact a side wave? Okay. When we apply it to a capacitor, it helps create a phase shift. All right. So um, there's always, always going to be a different phase shift between voltage and current, all right? And they are always 90 degrees out of phase. Current always leads voltage by 90 degrees. And remember, we talked about this in the signal analysis chapter where we talked about leading and lagging signals. So this should just be kind of some review, okay? Now, how does a capacitor store energy? Uh, remember before, when I talked about when we had a DC all right, it would charge up and then it would act as an, an open and not allow current to pass, all right? Or when it was AC, okay, it would act as a short and allow the signal through. So this is how we store energy in the capacitor during an AC cycle, okay? So if we take a look, P, that's the power curve, okay? And the, we have voltage and current that are, uh, current is leading voltage by 90 degrees, okay? So power's at the maximum when V and I cross. Notice that's when the curves of power are at their maximum, right? When V and I cross. Okay, so that's how we find the maximum power. Okay, when we solve these, we use capacitors and we call that the reactive power. So the unit for react reactive power is VAR, a volt ampere reactive. So that's when we calculate power. So remember we calculate power with Watt's law, okay? Uh, power is what? V squared over R, I squared R, and power is VI. So those are all Watt's laws. Same exact thing that we apply here, all right? So power is voltage RMS times current RMS. Remember we're using RMS because it's an AC circuit. All right, we have to do that. And then power is V squared over uh, reactance, okay? Or I squared times the reactance, 
It's really the difference is we're using a reactance value instead of a resistance value. Another important aspect of capacitors is we use them in rectifiers. Uh, rectifiers are where we go from AC to DC uh, when we're talking electricity. So the little brick that you plug your cell phone into, that's a rectifier. The brick on the end of your laptop, that's a rectifier, okay? So a couple different kind of rectifiers here. We have what we call a half wave rectifier and a full wave rectifier. All right, so what's a half wave rectifier do? It only keeps the positive sine wave and wipes out the negative portion of the sine wave. So you can see on the left hand side of the half wave rectifier what goes in and what comes out. All right, only the pulsing uh, positive portions of the sine wave. A full wave rectifier takes that entire sine wave and makes it all positive. So all the negative portions of the sine wave get reversed up or flipped up and everything is positive. Okay, so that's kind of how a rectifier works when we take those signals. So, you know, the first one might be a clock signal, the other one we're gonna filter down and actually make DC. All right, so what really happens is we take a capacitor and we put it on a rectifier and it smooths out the wave by discharging on the down part of the slope. All right, so we take in, the, so this is kind of what a, a rectifier looks like. We're gonna send in that AC signal. All right, we're gonna rectify it, and then we're gonna put a capacitor on it so that it flattens the signal out. All right, so when you see this schematic on a test, we're on the Siemens test, all right? This is on the Siemens test question as well. All right, that's a full wave rectifier that you see there. All right, you see the transformer? All right, so there's a transformer on the left-hand side, that tilde, that means AC. And then you have four diodes, kind of making that diamond piece. Okay, remember what diodes do, that they control the direction of current. So we're able to control the current and grab the waveforms, and then the capacitor filters and levels off the waveform. So it eventually smooths that pulsating DC form, or the, the pulsating sine wave, into a flat DC signal as such, all right? So that's the whole point of the capacitor. So the capacitor smooths the waves out, all right? So they're eventually flat, because remember DC, something is either on or it's off. You're getting zero volts or 12 volts all the time. Zero volts, five volts all the time. So DC is either on or off, and we use a rectifier uh, to do that, all right? So that's the end of the chapter. I need you to make sure that you know all the key terms, which I'll scroll through for you. All right, so that you can pause the video and write them down. Or if you want to look them up with a book, they are at the uh, end of the chapter as you do your reading. Okay, those will always be on the test, so make sure that you do know all the key terms. Okay, so uh, we only got one more chapter to go. Uh, be on the lookout, I'll probably have one more video of uh, solving a capacitive circuit, uh, doing more, a little bit more work with doing uh, the reactance uh, for it, as well as finding total capacitance in a series or parallel circuit and total reactance in a series or parallel circuit. All right, remember as always, you can email me with questions or if you need to Zoom meet or team meet or something like that online and go through all this, uh, I'll be more than happy to help you. Anyhow, have a good day, guys. We'll see you soon.